come online tonight to the latest Kahima Educational Trust webinar. We're really pleased to have uh, you with us tonight. We're going to um, wait just a few moments whilst everyone logs on and make sure that their uh, computers are working and sorts out their sound. We've got people coming in from all over the world tonight, um, from Nagaland um, and the United States and Australia and the UK. And it's marvelous to, after this enforced hiatus, to be able to get back together and talk about the subject we all like to talk about, which is Nagaland and the war. And um, it's going to be really exciting tonight because we've got, um, believe it or not, the granddaughter of Colonel Bruno Brown of the Assam Rifles, uh, regiment rather, talking to us, Charlotte Carty. Uh, and I'll make that mistake every now and again, Charlotte, you'll have to forgive me. Uh, but it's really exciting that for the first time in a long while, we can do what you all know I've been banging on about, which is raising the profile of the Indian soldiers who fought at Kahima, indeed, throughout Burma. Uh, during the campaign. So hopefully um, you're all getting seated, you've got a nice coffee or something to hand to drink, and uh, we'll go for about an hour. Um, Charlotte's going to do most of the talking, and if time allows at the end of this we'll have a little bit of time for, um, for questions. So during the talk just send questions through on chat, and we'll collect them all. And if we can't, don't have the chance to answer them tonight, then we'll do that by email subsequently. But um, we might just go over the hour to make sure that everyone has their questions answered. But it's going to be an exciting session tonight, and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing Charlotte. And it's absolutely fabulous to have first-hand accounts from a family member of uh, the Assam Regiment. Right, Sylvia. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to you all. It's been some time since we've had a KUT webinar, but this one coming up tonight will have been worth the wait. Tonight, we're going to tell the story of the 1st Assam Regiment's part in the Battle of Kahima. From the Cabal Valley through Karasom and Jessamy, we will hear about the vital role that the 1st Assam Regiment played in defending Kahima. The commanding officer of First Assam was William Felix Bruno Brown, and it is my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker, Charlotte Carty. Charlotte is a military history enthusiast and has spent many months researching the Assam Regiment, not least because, as Rob has already let us all know, she is the youngest of Bruno Brown's five grandchildren. This gives her a unique window, which is what I love and we've loved about this, into a more personal and behind the scenes study of what became the most momentous and decisive part of the whole campaign. But to give some background to her story is KET and regular trustee, Dr. Robert Lyman, author of many books on the Burma campaign, most recently, The War of Empires, he has also been studying the enormous contribution made by the Assam regiments, often overlooked in the past. We will endeavour to answer questions at the end, but if time is against us, we will answer any questions you have by email. And also, should there be any technical glitch, I will just say, please be patient, re-click on your link, and hopefully we will all get back together again. But I'm just, you know, giving the fire alarm instructions, really. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Rob for what promises to be a fascinating hour. Thanks. Fabulous, Sylvia. Thank you very much indeed for the introduction, and uh, I'm as excited as you are. I'm just going to spend a few moments before I hand over to Charlotte, uh, just um, reminding everyone of the context of April 1944, so that when Charlotte talks about the Assam Regiment, the 1st Battalion, the Assam Regiment, there were two battalions, but the 1st Battalion was the one we're talking about, uh, you can understand uh, what they were doing and why. Well, you will all know, of course, the strategic importance of Kahima uh, to the defense of India and the fact that the Japanese regarded Kahima as a vital part of their target in Operation Ugo, Operation C, which was the invasion of India in 1944, began in March 1944. Um, the British actually knew the, pri the previous December, December 1943, that an invasion was coming. Uh, British intelligence was pretty sophisticated. 
and uh, they knew that Mutiguchi was going to launch an offensive into um, Manipur and part of Assam. The assumption was that Imphal, the capital of Manipur, would be the primary target, but that the Japanese would also make a play across the hills via Kahima into the Brahmaputra Valley itself to, to Dimapur. Uh, what the British had no idea about, though, was the size and strength of the thrust that the Japanese um, were going to push across the Assam Hills uh, into, into Dimapur. That would have to wait for the battle itself to start. Now, it's important also to realize that uh, there was divided understanding in the Japanese army, the 15th army led by Mutaguchi uh, Renya, as to what uh, the Japanese were going to do with Kahima. Suffice to say, Kahima was very important to the Japanese. Uh, either way, the Japanese would take Kahima uh, in, in their plans. Now, the problem with the British, of course, at the time was that um, there, were, there was confusion in the decision-making uh, at very senior levels about the importance of Kahima. And in the days that ran up to the 4th of April, 1944, Confusion reigned also on the battlefield. Now, I'm not going to tell you much more about the battle because that's going to be Charlotte's job, but it's very important for you all to remember that we have inherited, certainly in the United Kingdom, this idea that Kahima was a British battle fought by British soldiers, and in particular, the siege, the first part of the engagement in Kahima from the 4th to the 20th of April was a uniquely British battle. And it's true that the British played a very, very significant part. We all know about the 4th Battalion of the Royal West Kents, the Dirty Half Hundred, that famous Territorial Army Battalion of 450 men that did wonders on the ridge in those first three weeks of April. But we must not forget that the Dirty Half Hundred, the Royal West Kents, uh, constituted only a third of the fighting men on the ridge. And two thirds of the fighting men uh, were made up of men of the Assam Regiment and the Assam Rifles. And to tell this story, Charlotte, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you tonight. We're really excited to have the granddaughter, Bruno Brown, commanding officer of the 1st Battalion, the Assam Regiment, with us to tell us the story tonight. Thank you, Rob, um, and welcome everybody. And thank you for coming and listening tonight to the story of the Assam Regiment, as I know it to be. Um, um, I will try and share my screen with you now, so just bear with me, please, if you don't mind, whilst I just go and try and find where we are. Um, and I will hopefully then take you through um, when I can hopefully share my screen with you, but you're seeing all of it. Let's see if I can get rid of that to see if I can make it full screen for you. I do apologise. Here we are. That's the little sign I'm looking for, the wine glass, as Sylvia told me to look for. <laughs> so here we are, um, the role of the Assam Regiment in 1944. I am indeed the youngest grandchild of Bruno Brown, and my grandfather was the CEO of the Assam during the Kahima episode. My, my mother would tell us a little bit about her time in India when she was growing up. She was actually evacuated there in um, 1941, 1942, but she fondly remembers her time growing up in Assam. And uh, she would talk a little bit about the Kohima battle when I was younger. And it was interesting because during my history lessons, it's not something that I ever really heard about, not one of the major uh, war, war battles that was talked about. Um, so I tried to find out a little bit more about it and everything I read seemed to really Really, the narrative was about the, as, as Rob was saying, about the British Army's side of the battle. Um, my mother gave me to read the history of the Sam Regiment by Peter Stein, which had been written fairly shortly after the end of the war. And what I read there didn't seem to be reflected in anything else that I was um, really seeing. So I just tried to get a little bit deeper into it and uh, read lots of other books and tried to piece together the story to give a little bit of a richer texture to perhaps the build up to the battle and the first part of the battle itself. So going back a little bit um, to the formation. Back in 1914, there was no regular infantry from Assam. There was an Assam light infantry but they were not recruited from the, uh, the hills there. 
um, men from the province did serve in the police force. They are the Assam Rifles. And in fact, some of the Nagas had fought in the trenches for the Allies during the Great War, mainly for the Gorkha, Gorkha, Gurkha um, um, regiments. But it wasn't until 1940 that the Chief Minister of Assam proposed that a regular regiment um, be raised for the Indian Army. And it was approved by the Governor of Assam and the plan was to put into practice on the 30th of January, 1941. So not long before everything was kicking off in the, in the hills of the Himalayas. The gentleman chosen as the commanding officer elect was Colonel Ross Howman. Here he is in the center, um, uh, looking mighty fine with all his uh, team around him. And next door, the slightly smaller impish chap here, this is my great grandfather. We all struggle slightly with height in our family. So that is genetic. Um, and uh, so this was the team that he was pulling together. Um, he was known, Colonel Hellman was known um, as a- Charlotte. Uh, yes. Charlotte, we, we're not seeing your full screen. Oh, no. We're still, on, we're still on the first slide. Ah. If you click on that um, first slide again, and click on the wine glass because whatever you did before didn't actually work. Right, I'll escape and I'll click on the wine glass again. So you have the full screen. Can you see the next, next, uh, can you see the next slide? Not yet. It's still on um, Saving Gahima, the first slide. Ah. I wonder, well, it might be that you're going to see the slides. And if, if I go back, um, let me see. And can you see my screen there? Yes, we can see you uh, yeah. and your cursor there. We can see that, yes. Well, do you mind if, if it's so quietly there, it's slightly smaller screen, but rather than um, not to be but able that to will, That will work, yes. So, so there we are, Colonel Harmon in the middle. Here he is with his team. And um, the gentleman, his right-hand man, quite literally, um, sitting next to him is my grandfather. Um, Bruno Brown. And um, Colonel Hellman was known as a man of unusual knowledge and experience with great powers of organization and command. And they decided to recruit from the, the northeastern seven sister states and from the, the tribes there, this, the Assamese, the Naga, the Lushai and the Kuki. Um, they were getting everything ready. It was going relatively well, but they were having teething troubles due to the monsoon. And there was some setback. Um, but uh, help came with Colonel Brown um, and he came, well, Major Brown as he was at the time, and he came over at the time he had been on the Northwest Frontier at a place called Citral, which some might know was also famous for its own siege back in the late 1800s. Um, apparently he jumped in his car when he was told about this post and drove straight across the north of India to Shillong, which was where the Assam were going to be based, and he was camping out at night along the roadside. Um, and he, when, he, when he arrived, he was hot, thirsty, hungry and tired, but was nevertheless ready within five minutes of his arrival to back his superior in any scheme, legal or otherwise, um, that, that's a bit of a theme too, um, which would forward the justifiable end in view. And there was luckily a break in the monsoon, which allowed the plans to be accelerated for the inauguration. And they wanted to get on with things, Howman and Brown, and they asked uh, headquarters whether they could bring forward the inauguration, um, but they were less uh, keen to wait for an answer. And so on the 15th of June, 1941, there was the parade at Government House in Shillong, where the government of Assam addressed the troops at the conception um, of the, uh, the Assam Regiment. And it was that evening that Howman and Brown sat down and suddenly realized that there was indeed a military crime of raising a battalion in times of war without permission. Um, however, they hoped that headquarters would be pleased that somebody had just gone on and got on with it, which uh, hopefully I think turned out to be the case. So just a little map to give you a, a brief idea of where we all are. So Kohima, lots of people here on the webinar will know about Kohima. Um, Shillong is where the Assam were based, which was over here towards the west. And one of the first places that they were deployed was up into Digboy, up and to the northeast, which was where the oil fields were. And um, uh, it was up here that very soon, as you six months into the sort of being of the Assam Regiment, that uh, Colonel Howman was promoted. And he was asked to move to Delhi to headquarters there. 
Um, so he was very sad. The regiment was very sad to be to losing their um, commanding officer. Um, but uh, Colonel Brown took over. Uh, after having been the second in command, he took over as uh, the commanding officer at that time. And one of their first jobs uh, was to, uh, to, to do some patrolling in this area. They went to a place called Ledo, um, just to the south east. I'm going to hopefully show you a map where it is, but it's not terribly clear because not many of the maps have it on. So Dig Boy is here and Ledo is just here. Hopefully you can see my cursor on the screen. Um, and what they were doing there, they were, the, all the maps were inaccurate and out of date and were really no use at all. And no one really knew what lay in this area at all. In fact, there were some tribes up here who really, really hadn't seen many Western, Western people, hadn't come into much contact. Um, but they were patrolling here and they spent weeks living off the country um, in a beautiful uh, land full of tigers and rare species, which is now actually Myanmar. And this is part of the headwaters of the Chinwit River. Um, and it was pr pretty tough going and there was a lot of, lot of problems with malaria. Um, but they were able, able to get detailed reports sent back to headquarters about what they were finding. And what they actually were doing, although I don't know if they realized it at the time, was they were mapping out the initial stages of what later became the Stillwell Road. And I have a, a picture taken here. So this is Lido here. So Dig Boy would have been up here. Ledo, Lido, I'm not sure how to pronounce, apologies. Um, and this was the, the, the plans for the uh, Stillwell Road which was later built. Then um, in 1942, they were moved forward to the Kabor Valley. So here we are, um, this was Dig Boy up here. There we are, up here. And then we've got Kahima here, Infal, and they were actually moved to an area called Tamu. And what they were doing here in 1942 was protecting the rear of the um, British Army coming out of Burma. And um, this is where they came through and they were guarding the, the rear, rear um, echelons of the army as they came through. In fact, they were asked to, uh, to blow up the bridge here um, at the, uh, on the is it Lakao River. So they were based in Shenan and they were around Tamu. And as the army came through, they were protecting them. So at one point, um, there was just the Assam Regiment uh, protecting the rear guard of the, uh, uh, the withdrawing uh, British army um, between, between them and the approaching Japanese. But actually the Japanese didn't come through at that point. And so things quietened down. And what the Assam Regiment did at that point was to be sent across um, as almost as a guerrilla force into the other side of the river there um, and to, to, to do some patrolling to find out where the Japanese were. So this was in the Kabul Valley um, and it was incredibly tough, uh, really uh, difficult times with disease. Um, they were having to live off the land um, and they were told that if they got into trouble, they would be on their own. And um, Colonel Brown apparently replied that um, that's not a problem because these chaps know what they're doing here. This is where they live. That this is that this is like home to them. And they proved to be incredibly effective at patrolling in this difficult um, area and brought back wonderful information. But sadly, the disease um, disease uh, took a toll on the regiment, and they were actually sent back up to Dig Boy to rest and recuperate. And because they'd lost so, so many men and they needed to uh, sort of regroup somewhat. So we then find them back up at Dig Boy here, having left the area of, of, of the down um, in the south uh, here. And then that continued until 19th of February in 1944, when they were leaving Dig Boy, they had had orders to go forward to Kahima. And the orders were that they were going to be guarding the exit from the Somra Hills using patrols and they were to maintain close contact with forward screen of V-Force and the Assam rifles. And at this point, they were told that they must fight to the last man and the last round, which was slightly unusual because they were really being sent out as patrols. So it was somewhat strange, but that's the orders that they were given. And Rob very kindly shared with me a map that he had used in previous talks um, for uh, KET 
which gives you a little highlight of some of the more um, important areas of the battles. We have Kahima here. They were being sent forward the Assam to Jessamine and to the village of Karasom. And obviously here's Dimapur, which is where um, the high command thought that the main thrust of the uh, Japanese attack was going to be uh, aiming for. And this is a, a little bit of a, a slide showing where people were based at that time. So people were coming up, the 1st Battalion the Sam Regiment were coming up to Jessamai. There was another a company going on to Karasom. You had V Force at Fort Kiri. And, um, and here you had the Japanese coming forward. And in Dimapur, you had nothing at all, um, which was what one of the big concerns was. But here we find ourselves um, um, in, um, in early Feb in mid February, um, and they were being pulled forward to Kohima. I did find an interesting little um, story where, as they moved forwards, uh, the Assam Regiment. This is where the, uh, the soldiers were actually provided with their Tommy guns for the first time. A lot of it had that they'd been actually practicing with sticks in a real dad's army fashion. And apparently the soldiers were quite pleased to find out that they um, were actually going to be using real guns um, as they faced the, uh, the onslaught of the enemy. But here's a picture of Pawsey's bungalow. Pawsey was a deputy commissioner of the Naga Hills at the time. And uh, his bungalow is quite famous, I think, for those who know the Kahima battle. Um, and this was the beautiful building of a sort of um, colonial style that uh, the deputy commissioner was uh, living in at the time. And when the Assam was uh, gathering at Kahima, and they were just about to move forwards to Jessamai and Karasom in the Somra, Somra uh, Hills, um, Pawsey invited them to a drinks party the night before they were to go forwards. And he invited some of the nurses from the hospital that was at Kahima and the officers of the Assam regiment were to attend as well. And apparently my grandfather was taking it all very seriously and decided that all his uh, officers should attend in full battle uh, uniform. And there was a gentle amusement by this uh, because there still wasn't a real understanding from many as to quite the size of force or the seriousness of the situation. And so the idea that all these officers would take it very seriously and were in full battle gear um, led to some to make um, uh, a comment about how it reminded them of the night before the Battle of Waterloo and Wellington and the ball there and how they had all been in their full uniform. There was general giggling about it all, but perhaps Brown knew more than he was telling or perhaps believed his Naga scouts more than the uh, perhaps high command uh, did. So they moved forwards and uh, I'm just going to show you pictures um, of where they were heading to. So we have Kahima here, and then we have Jess and I here. It's 60 miles um, on the road. Um, in the books that I was reading recently, I did an internet search. It says it's 80. I think they might have been building some more roads. Um, but I think as a crow flies, it's actually much shorter distance. But you'll see why the roads take longer when I show you some photographs of it in a second. But you also have Karasom um, to the south as well. Very important um, battle was taking place here. And the KET did a fantastic um, webinar on that a few months ago. And uh, we learned all about uh, Jock Young, who is based here. I'll touch on that in just a second. A couple of other interesting villages, Merrily here and Feck as well. And so this was the, the, the journey that they were going to have to make up to Jessamy. And these are the sorts of hills that they are taking on when they're doing that. Absolutely stunning, but very difficult to get across. So it's quite understandable why High Command didn't think the Japanese would get a large force through here. Um, but the Japanese turned out to be far better at that than anybody realized. So the, the uh, Sam Regiment were making their way forwards to Jessamy. And they took about a week to get there. I think it was five days with all their equipment as they marched the 60 miles. There weren't metal roads, there were a few metal roads, but they stopped fairly soon after Kohima. And then it was a lot of bridle tracks um, and very poor, poor conditions um, in terms of the, what, what's underfoot. But it was a beautiful part of the world. 
And this is around Carasson. Again, you can see a stunning, um, uh, stunning countryside landscapes, but terribly difficult to get across. But they set themselves up, and this gives you a, hopefully a, 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 an idea of where, a closer idea of where they all are. So you've got Jessamai here, and you have Carasson to the south, Merrily, and Feck here. And what they did when they started uh, at Jessamai, once they settled there, the work, A Company under uh, Jock Young went forward to Carasson. And Colonel Brown sent out lots of patrols from Jessaby to try to find out what was going on and where the Japanese were and what force and was trying to find out as much information as possible to give back to command. And in fact, the first encounter that they had was at a village called Molhe. I haven't been able to find this on any maps anywhere, but there's a little sign here saying it's somewhere, somewhere to the east. Um, one of the patrols, when they went out, they ha had reports from Nagas fleeing um, from their villages. And the Nagas were saying that 300 Japanese had crossed the Chindwit and were advancing along the Somra tracks. And at the night, there were more villages coming through, villagers coming through with their torches along the tracks. And at this point, um, the, the commanders of the little patrol decided to send Naga runners back to Jessamai with the news. And it was jolly lucky because actually there was no other intelligence of this movement of Japanese forces coming in. So it was very lucky that they had bumped them here at Molhe. And um, they were then decided to, to, to harry the enemy um, at this point and were trying to slow them down. Um, and when Colonel Brown got the message at Jessamy that there was this force coming through, he sent forward some reinforcements to try to help them disengage and come back. But actually the, the force coming towards them was quite overwhelming and they all got dissipated into the various villages, into the various valleys um, that were surrounding this area, got quite lost to some of them. Um, and, um, but some did manage to get back to Mirali and there's some reports of how they also got back messages to Jessamy uh, about what they were encountering when they got up to Merrily. Another patrol had been working to the north and they had also come into contact in the north with the uh, Japanese, seen evidence of Japanese within the villages and the villages up there were saying how the Japanese had been visiting them. And there was a, a, a one gentleman called Corlette. He proves to be an interesting man. He was a captain at the time and he was at, uh, at well, he was actually at Merrily at the time, and he reported back about the what the patrols had been finding. And um, he was asked to stay near Merrily and Feck to keep an eye and to report back any further messages. And it was very lucky that he was told to stay up there because he was um, um, a very important person in the um, the encounters to come. So next we move on to what was happening in Carasson. So the first contact at Molhe was about the 25th of March. And on the 27th of March, that's when the first um, fire was exchanged at Carasson. Colonel, uh, Colonel, I beg your pardon, Captain Young saw a uh, Japanese were coming down the track and he contacted Jessamy um, by, on the radio and explained that he was about to open fire and that he did so. And unfortunately, that was the last that we heard um, from Jock Young. The, the company there fought incredibly bravely. After three days of fighting, the Japanese had made no progress at all. And the, the, the defenders were not sleeping, not eating. It was incredibly busy and difficult. And the Japanese were so frustrated on the third night that they actually burnt down the village of Karasong. On the next day, there was a further onslaught. It was becoming quite clear as re renewed forces were coming in from the Japanese of what was going to happen to the small company. However, he was also um, serving with the order of uh, he must stand until the last man and the last round. But he also saw the futility of losing all the men of his company with so many Japanese approaching. So during a heavy bombardment that evening, he called his company commanders together and he ordered that a company should withdraw, but in strict compliance with his instructions not to surrender the position, 
he would remain behind. And his words from an eyewitness were, my orders were to fight to the last man, I shall obey those orders and I shall be the last man. Nor would it be right for me to leave the wounded alone. There is no argument, it is an order. Now his um, company commanders were not very happy, but they obeyed his order and they, they returned. Some made it back to Jesemiah, some made it back to Kahima. But Young then set about destroying any remaining equipment that there was. The villagers heard explosions. Um, Young went round the trenches, visiting the wounded, trying to raise their spirits. One of these wounded um, who was badly uh, affected with one of his legs, he dragged himself to Young's bunker and he apparently sat up and he saluted and said, I will stay with you, Sahib. And at first light, the Japanese attacked again. And there were reports that there were hand grenades being, um, uh, hand grenade explosions being heard. There was then machine gun fire, and then there was silence. And uh, it was a very brave young man, and uh, we, we should all be very grateful to him. And there is an interesting group of photographs. I was very fortunate to go on an Indus expedition with um, Bob Cook, the curator of the Kohima Museum in York, along with a lovely band of um, like-minded people who joined us on the, on the trip up to Kohima. And we were lucky enough to return to the Assam Regiment um, in Shillong to their headquarters. And they have a museum there. And these photographs were on the wall of the museum. I apologize for the quality because I was taking quick snaps at the time, not realizing that in a few years time, I might be doing a talk uh, on the internet. Um, but these are photographs on the wall of the museum. And they're showing one of the Naga gentlemen who used to know Jock Young, showing where the positions were and where the bunker was. And this is where he was saying this was Captain Young's command post. And he's pointing to where he later, he, where Captain Young was killed as well. And he actually helped um, find his body and make sure that it was buried appropriately. And on the right, there are pictures of Jack Young in happier times as well. I thought it was rather nice to share that. He's a very brave man and he's not been recognized sufficiently for, for all that he did. Moving back to Jessamy, um, so, 27th of March, the battle at Karasom started. And it was at, back at Jessamy um, on the 28th of March, the battle there real started taking place. I found this photograph um, on the internet and it's actually taken by Ursula Graham Bowers, the, who was the queen of the Nagas. Um, it, this was during her tour around the area in 1939. And it just gives you a flavor of the sort of buildings that were up in the village at the time. And moving on to the, uh, the picture of the, the battleground itself, and they've chosen uh, the, the junction of two tracks uh, leading back to Kihima, and then one was going on to Karasom and one to Kichang. And this is where they uh, chose to hold their position. So the village was actually slightly away from the battle site. And they, this was the area they were digging in as their perimeter. But when they were um, preparing, they stayed in this bivouac area just to the south. And they were lucky because they had barbed wire here, which is something I understand wasn't available at Kohima. Um, and um, they were digging themselves in and they did have about a month to prepare. So they'd arrived in late February and this was now late March. And there's a nice comment in one of the books that I was reading which um, said um, that Colonel Brown was no military genius, but that he did have the bunker um, positions that had been used in the Arakan by General Mezeve, I think it is. And they proved very well um, to, to be very useful defensive positions. So they dug those um, and, and they proved very effective for the defenders. They had uh, several visits from high command. And one of the last visits, uh, Colonel Richards, who was the, com the garrison commander at Kohima, when he came to visit, Colonel Brown actually asked him where the last man, last round order should stand, because it was quite clear by that time that the information coming through was that there was a very large force of Japanese making their way through the hills. 
and that uh, it seemed uh, um, silly to be trying to defend these track positions when perhaps it would be better to concentrate back in uh, Kohima, which was perhaps a more important position to try to hold. Um, Colonel Richards said that he had no orders, that he, he didn't have the, the ability to countermand the order so that it must stand, but apparently it did worry him. He wrote in his book that he didn't, he wasn't happy with the order at all. Um, they were making their final preparations. There was a, a runaway fire actually from the, the, the Naga villages were clearing their land for their agriculture. And uh, there was a runaway fire from that burn, which nearly took out all their ammunition supplies. It nearly blew everything up. Um, but thankfully they managed to stop it in time, but it did reduce an awful lot of cover on the Eastern side. Um, and uh, yes, they, at, at this point, they uh, didn't have any water supply. So the water supply is a half a mile away in the river valley. Jessamine actually sits on the ridge between two, uh, uh, two rivers, and very steep ridges they are too. So getting water was going to be difficult. And what they managed to do was to bring up enough water for five days used with the strictest of um, uh, limitation. And they were using any container that they possibly could, be that kerosene tins or bamboo chungas um, or tarpaulins, anything to try to make sure they had enough water to make it through the battle. They had a final meal, a final hot meal um, on the 29th of the 27th. And on the 28th, Major Askew reported 24 Japanese coming down the Karasong track. And then the five day battle began. And they didn't have time to eat or sleep. They were just fighting day and night. Um, and in the day they were bombarded. At night, the, the Japanese infantry would try and come in and, um, and, uh, and move into the perimeter. I should actually add, importantly, that they'd moved from this bivouac area on about the 25th of May, they'd moved to March, they'd moved into the perimeter area here. So they were fighting here, having abandoned this bivouac area. And so they were, they were defending themselves um, for their lives, quite literally. At the same time, High Command was now reconsidering the order to fight to the last man and the last round and decided that perhaps it was a good idea to get as many of the Assam Regiment back um, to Kohima after all. Unfortunately, um, all the lines of communication at that point had been cut, so they couldn't get the message through to them. So they were still both Jock Young, obviously a head in Karasom, and Brown here at Jessamai, were under the impression without communication that they had to hold these positions um, to, to, to the end. And uh, they, um, they were fighting uh, uh, night and day and uh, the, the high command sent some men forward to try to get a message through. And it also sent an airplane from Dimapur with a message. Now the message, they managed to drop it, but they dropped it unfortunately in the old bivouac area. So down here. Um, there's also reports, it's difficult to know, because um, it's not clear from all the books, there's sort of some of the uh, stories slightly differ, but there seemed to have been a second aeroplane sent as well, which also dropped the message on the old bivouac area. The other unfortunate um, element of this uh, store part of the story is that they dropped the messaging clear. So the Japanese managed to find out that the Assam was supposed to withdraw back to Kohima before the Assam knew that they were supposed to withdraw back to Kohima. And they redoubled their efforts to try to overrun the positions as a result. As I say, Brown at this point was still unaware of the order to withdraw. Luckily, one of the, uh, the, the soldiers sent forward with the order on foot happened to end up in the village of Fek which Captain Corlett from the Assam happened to be in at the same time. When he heard about the order to withdraw, he was convinced because he could still see the battle raging beneath him and over the hills he could see at Ojesimai. He was convinced that uh, Brown had not received the order. So he asked permission to try to get through the enemy lines and deliver the order uh, himself. And uh, he was given that permission, a very brave uh, gentleman indeed. And he went with an Naga guide and they made it through the enemy lines and climbing up and they actually found themselves in the old bivouac area 
where they were fired upon by the Japanese. Um, he then approached the perimeter where he was fired upon by the British, um, um, but he had a very distinctive um, speech uh, pattern. Unfortunately, he had a very strong lisp, so he was shouting wildly to everybody there that it was actually Captain Corlett and please stop firing. And thankfully, the soldiers recognised his lisp and allowed him to enter the perimeter. But that wasn't actually the end of his problems because he still had to get to the command post. And by this stage of the battle, um, uh, the uh, Brown um, had ordered uh, everybody to be in their trenches, and if anything was out of their trenches, that almost certainly it was enemy and therefore should be shot. So poor uh, Corlett had to still get from the perimeter into the command post and was again fired on, um, but <laughs> managed to finally get to Brown in the command post. Brown still didn't believe him, it took some, some effort to convince Brown that he should be with, withdrawing, um, but eventually he did. But at that point of the night, um, it was too, uh, too busy. They were, they were fighting on all sides, so they couldn't with, um, create a, a withdrawal. But the next morning, when things had gone a bit quieter again and the Japanese infantry had withdrawn, um, he called the commanders together and, and said that uh, that night uh, they were, as soon as it was dark, to start their withdrawal back to Kohima. The next day, the Japanese redoubled their efforts again, um, and actually at five o'clock in the afternoon, a huge hole opened in the eastern perimeter. And uh, it was clear that they couldn't wait till, till dark, uh, otherwise they'd been overrun. So Brown went round all the positions he could get to and telling everybody to leave as soon as they could disengage. And so they started leaving um, um, as, as and when they could with the final, um, as a, uh, post being left was the battalion headquarters, which was abandoned about midnight once all the papers and documents had been burnt. And in fact, it's recorded that the only thing that they had left when they eventually in late April reconvened in Dimapur after the, main, um, the first part of the siege um, had been completed at Kohima. Uh, the only thing that they had left from the Assam regiment was one brass seal. So at midnight, Brown was leaving the command post. And I'm just going to show you a picture of what we discovered when we were lucky enough to make it up to Jessamine in 2019. Um, it was an extraordinary, to, extraordinary to be able to go there. And we found, um, were led to actually by the, the local villagers, what I think was the old bivouac area or the edge of the perimeter area. We were told that this was the very escarpment that the Assam went down um, to uh, evade the, uh, the Japanese. So um, on the uh, left of the screen is the top looking across back to Kohima. And then this is actually down the escarpment looking back up to where we were taking the photographs up here. And as you can see, this was a sort of land that they were trying to negotiate their way 60 miles back to Kohima, steep, um, they'd been fighting for five days, they hadn't eaten, they hadn't slept, they hadn't drunk properly. Um, all the tracks were ambushed, um, so they had to uh, effect a fighting withdrawal all the way back to Kohima. And there were 500 men that went forward to Jessamai and Karasan of the Assam. And actually during each of those main engagements, not many of the men were lost. It was actually during withdrawal that they lost um, the, most of their casualties. Just to show a couple of pictures of, uh, again, this was um, pictures on the wall of the Assam Regimental Museum in Shillong. And again, I'm sorry the picture quality isn't great, but these were sort of just taken just after the battle, um, showing the old trenches um, uh, at Jessamai. This, this one here shows you where the water was. It's down in this valley here, it's a half a mile away, um, up and down some very steep hills. Um, this was another old trench in Jessamai here. Um, and, uh, and this apparently was um, the battalion officer's mess originally and became an oil dump. And when we were lucky enough to travel there, we found this commemorative um, plaque in the, at the junction of the two tracks. Um, which was uh, wonderful to find. Um, and, and then we were led forward to, I think, what was the old Bivouac area. And we found uh, uh, this Jessamai Wall Memorial, which again, we were, in, uh, I had no idea that it was there. And it was uh, wonderful and touching to, to, to see it there. But 
I, I was absolutely astonished um, when you have, when you sort of read about the withdrawal and what they'd gone through during the battle and then what they had to go through during the withdrawal to then make it back to Kohima. I am, and I've struggled to understand how they would do that. And then I saw the, the, the geography of what they had to do when we went traveling there in 2019 and it became even more unfathomable um, quite what they managed to do. Um, as they were retreating or withdrawing, um, one um, officer reported um, back how he, he was helped by the Nagas. Um, he was going blind with shock and hunger and the Naga villagers saved him. And they put him to bed in a large double bed. And when he woke up next to him was a pillow saying home sweet home um, embroidered on it, which was rather lovely. Um, and, and there's another story of uh, um, an officer leading the Assam out of the end of one of the villages, Naga villages, and uh, they've been, been very helpful to, to the Assam. And they were going out of one of the villages as the Japanese were marching in in pursuit of the Assam at the other end of the village. And these villages aren't very big. So it was incredibly tight uh, that they got away at all. And many didn't. Um, Colonel Richards wrote rather movingly um, about how he uh, found the Assam regiment coming back into Kohima. He, he wrote that on the 2nd of April, the men of the Assam regiment from Karasong came in. And it was on the 3rd of April that Colonel Brown came in with some 260 men from Jessamai. He said the arrival of Colonel Brown and his men marching in with their heads held erect was one of the finest sights of the battle. Until his arrival, no one knew what had happened to him. And one of the final insults, actually, as they marched the last phase into Kohima, was the RAF came and they strafed them with fire, believing them to be the Japanese. So um, they did, thankfully, make it back to Kohima, but they were in a bit of a mess. They were exhausted and hungry. Many didn't have boots and were in tattered clothing. And Brown's ragged condition so more moved the deputy commissioner, Mr. Palsy, that he actually went straight to his bungalow and found him a polo sweater. And uh, apparently Colonel Brown wore that all the way through the rest of the siege. And so, yes, that brings us where we are to, to back to Kohima and the dispositions at the time, um, at the beginning of April, um, when, when the Japanese were just coming into the outskirts of the village. So the, the main body of the, the Jessamai uh, Assam Regiment came in on the 3rd of April. And I understand that the first skirmish in the outskirts of Kohima happened on the 4th of April. So the Assam didn't have long to, to recover, um, turn around, dig in, um, before they then had to take their, their positions on um, Kohima Ridge. And they were actually all over the ridge. So some were on Garrison Hill, some were on IGH Spur, and some were on FSD, and some were on Jail Hill. And just a, another picture I found from uh, one of the books, which gives a, 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 an enlarged photograph of this sort of Garrison Hill area um, and the bungalow sector. And for those who are, are, are familiar with the battle, you have the DC's bungalow down here, um, the tennis court, the very famous tennis court here, and Garrison Hill here. And you can see the Royal West Kent headquarters, because of course by this stage, the Royal West Kent had arrived, thank goodness, 500, 460 soldiers. And you had Garrison headquarters with Colonel Richards here. I understand that my grandfather was sort of based around here, near the ADS, near Garrison headquarters, and near um, Royal West Kent's headquarters as well. And so um, this is where they were on the, um, on the 4th of April. And then the battle itself, or the siege itself, started again. So having been fighting since uh, some from the 27th, of March, some from the 25th of March at Mulhay, and 27th of March at, uh, at Karasom, and then the 28th of March at Jessamai. Here they are, and they're about to face the siege, which in many books is where the, the, the Battle of Kohima starts. Um, but actually, a lot of the Indian soldiers, um, with the help of the Nagas, had been fighting for some time prior to that. Just I managed to find a contemporary picture, which was taken, I understand, during the siege. Um, um, uh, of Kohima, um, and I just thought it just goes to show some of the conditions that they, they found uh, up there. 
Apparently, they were very grim um, and hygiene barely existed. I did read in one account that there was a commanding officer in the commanding officer's sector on Garrison Hill. There was a foul tent which served as a latrine, but it was unfortunately in a fully exposed position. And it was only the most intrepid who considered it safe to use. Um, but as it happened, the tent remained unscathed in all its unsavory glory to the very end of the siege. And so we can move forward. This is the this is where they were they were fighting. Um, the the Assam were involved in all sorts of different actions. Um, as I say, they were on Jail Hill. Um, they went forward um, to attack the tennis court at a particular uh, sorry the bungalow sector. Um, they were the, some of the on the 13th of April, um, there were some particularly bad attacks and terrible shelling. And there's a um, uh, narrative about how the uh, advanced dressing station was overflowing with casualties. And some of the less severely wounded were actually placed in Colonel Brown's care in his sector because there was no room in the ADS. And it was on the 14th of April that the Assam relieved the Royal West Kents who were protecting the bungalow sector. And this is actually where they stayed until the end of the siege, when they were relieved by the first Punjab, who made it up on the 18th of April to, to break the siege. And it, um, Colonel Richards says that it was actually the Assam Regiment who were defending this sector for the longest period within the battle. Um, on the 16th of April, relief didn't arrive um, as promised, and it was decided well, uh, there was an attack um, on some Japanese positions across the tennis court. And this is where Wellington Massar of the Assam Regiment um, showed his huge bravery. During the attack, he provided covering fire by standing on the billiard table in the clubhouse above the tennis court. And he manned his Bren gun and managed to make sure that the soldiers advancing had cover. Unfortunately, his gun jammed, and it was at that point that he himself was hit. But as he fell from the, um, the billiard table, his gun unjammed, and he got himself back up and yet again managed to provide covering fire despite his wounds to make sure that the Assam soldiers got back to their bunkers safely. Um, he did make it to the end of the siege when he was running to Massar. He um, refused to go to the ADS. He wanted to stay with the men at the front. Um, he was ev evacuated down to Dimapur, but unfortunately he died of his wounds in May. He was awarded the Indian Distinguished Service Medal and was the first of the other ranks of the Assam to be decorated for gallantry in the field. And on the 17th of April, um, the perimeter is shrinking all the time, um, the area that they are defending on, on, the, on the hill at Kahima. And on the 17th of April, there was again intense bombardment. I believe, although it's quite tricky to track my grandfather down, um, but I think he was actually on, in the bunkers at the front at this point because they had so few men, he'd gone to the actual um, front um, sectors. And he, there is a story of him leading counterattacks personally um, from um, on, on FSD and at Kirki Pique um, Hill, which you can see in the middle here. There's another story of a captain within the Assam called Elwell, who unfortunately been wounded very badly um, in the head at the beginning of the siege, but again, he, was, he could still stand and fight. So he was required because they were getting short of men. Um, but he was really struggling to see. And uh, Richard, Colonel Richard, the commanding officer of the garrison, called Elwell to him to say he needed to know where Brown was and he needed somebody to go and find him. And Elwell pointed out that um, he couldn't really see much at all because of his uh, head injuries and his eye um, wounds. But he said that you know, that really was, was, was tough luck. And, and since he was the only man who probably could recognize Brown, he had to go forward. So poor Elwell was sent on this task to go crawling forwards to find him. And as Colonel Brown at the time had last been seen on FSD here. Um, and as he got down there in the dark, he found himself surrounded by Japanese and they seemed to be massing. And he thought, I think they're going to um, make an attack on Kirky Pique. And he tried to get back to Kirky Pique to, um, to raise the alarm. 
Um, unfortunately, he kicked over a kerosene ting. Um, all hell broke loose. He died for cover, uh, having thankfully to be in um, a British uh, trench on Kirky PK, um, and um, managed to find out that Brown was at, um, nearby. He managed to get hold of Brown and told him about the formation um, of the Japanese up on FSD. And Brown apparently thought it was going to be a good idea to counterattack. He was dissuaded by the three or four men who was with him because that's all they had. Um, and it was decided it'd be far better to report back to Colonel Richards on Garrison Hill about the potential uh, attack on Kirky Piquet. So they made it back to Garrison Hill, made this report to Richards. And as they came out of um, seeing Richards, they were overwhelmed by the, 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 the British soldiers coming off Kirky Piquet because actually they had, um, they had been overwhelmed. They had, uh, the Japanese had made the attack whilst um, Brown was talking to Richards and um, the British soldiers were uh, uh, coming off Kirky Piquet onto Garrison Hill. So this is the point on the 17th of April. By this point, this was the, the, the rest of the perimeter, which I believe was only about 350 yards um, square. And this is where everybody was on these a night of the 17th of April. And I, at that point, a lot of the soldiers were thinking, are we going to make it through the night? Because the Japanese tended to attack at night. There were so few soldiers, they were in such a poor state. And they were very concerned that were the uh, Japanese to press forward from Kirky Piquet at that point, that they probably would have been overrun. But for, for some reason, the Japanese that night decided not to push forward their advantage. And on the next morning, um, defensive fire was being brought down on the Japanese and uh, there was a breakthrough by uh, the, the, the forces coming up from Dimapur and the siege was finally broken on the morning of the 18th of April. By noon, the first Punjab had made contact and the wounded were evacuated uh, from the uh, hospital area and the Assam were uh, relieved from the tennis court area. And all Assam were asked to withdraw from their sectors onto the, uh, the commanding officer's sector. Um, and there's a, a, a telling commentary from the Royal Berkshires as they arrived on the 20th of April. Um, and they said they were most profoundly shocked by the conditions which prevailed on Garrison Hill. And the troops looked hollow-eyed, dirty and war beards the stench of festering corpse, corpses was overpowering and it was a veritable paradise for flies. But the survivors were just very glad to be alive. And this was the time for the Assam Regiment to make their way out of the siege. So on the 20th of April, they marched out. They had two, two miles to go to march down the road to get to the trucks. And so they were picked up at milestone 44 and a half on the road to Dimapur, got into the lorries, and they arrived in um, Dimapur at tea time, uh, so the war diary says. And it recalls that the men were very tired indeed, but were in excellent spirits. And they were given hot tea and a good meal. And each man had a stretcher, sheets, blankets, and a pillow for the night. And so that's where the, I leave them really on the 20th of April. Um, I was delighted in some of my research to find that Vera Lynn of, uh, had been out in um, Burma, um, and Burma. And in fact, I've, I've found evidence that she made it to Dimapur. I don't think she was there at this time. I think she was actually there in May rather than in April. But I like to think that perhaps the soldiers of the Assam Regiment after that battle had an opportunity to hear her sing. And just to also show you the nice picture of the lovely bungalow at the start of the battle, um, um, just as they left it on the night um, for their little drinks party on the 23rd of February. And then at the end of the siege, what was left of the bungalow area. Um, and now today, this is uh, Garrison Hill, with the cemetery and the tennis court at the top with a wonderful cross. And it's amazing to think that where we're standing here when we're taking this photograph remain British, and across the, the, the side of the other side of the tennis court was Japanese. And at the end of the battle, there were only, I, I've, I've seen evidence, um, comments that there was only 90 Royal West Kents left able to fight with a similar number of Assam able to fight. And they had been in some of the key positions such as holding the tennis court area. 
And when you think that at the start of the battle, there are about 1,500 defenders, that was the Royal West Kent, about 500, a SAM 250 or so, and the SAM rifles similarly. And at the end, there were only about 180 left standing able to fight. It turned out that it was quite important that the Assam did manage to extricate themselves from Karasom and Jessamai and get back. So that's a little bit of a story. There's one nice, what, last little piece that I found, which was from Slim. And um, when the Brown wrote to Slim to uh, com compliment him and congratulate him on the victory that they had won, um, Slim wrote back, and as you can see here, it says, many thanks for your kind congratulation. It had been through chaps like you and your troops that we have won our victories. And I'm more grateful to you all than I can say. And then specifically to the Assam, you may be the youngest unit under my command, but you're pretty precocious. Thank you very much indeed, Charlotte. I mean, that is absolutely amazing. And uh, let me just, uh, um, share my screen because whilst we've been talking Clive Fletcher Wood has gone and sent us through a photograph from the uh, cemetery at Kahima of the memorial to Wellington Massa who was known in the regiment as bad boy because uh, he was always getting into trouble with the regimental police uh, before the war and during the fighting of course he was uh, characteristically remarkable well that was an amazing talk. I'm, I'm absolutely overwhelmed. Thank you very much indeed for, for presenting it to us and giving us such a personal perspective, actually having someone from the family um, uh, describe it. It's amazing. I'm just going to ask you one question, Charlotte. Tell me very quickly, what happened to your grandfather after the battle? Well, the, the Sam didn't have very long to rest. Um, they, I think they had 10 days to two weeks in Dimapur, and then they were asked to, um, well, they volunteered, um, asked, volunteered, I'm not sure, um, to go back up to, to help um, on an area called Ring Contour, which I haven't yet discovered exactly where it is on the maps, but they pretty much stayed there throughout May and June, um, trying to find where the Japanese bunkers were. Again, more of the patrolling sort of role than outright front forces at that point. Um, as the Japanese retreated, they, the, the Assam followed them. They carried them on, following them back into Burma. Um, they uh, apparently were the first battalion back across um, the Chindwin River. And uh, whilst they pursued the Japanese, it was given to them as an honor for being so brave at uh, Karasom and Jessamai, uh, the honor of being the first back across the Chindwin. And they then pursued them uh, in, into, back into Burma. And, this, uh, the, what I've read, uh, very sadly, my grandfather didn't make it home. So they were uh, in Burma and they were approaching a, a very small village where divisional headquarters should have been. Um, they were doing a pincer movement to companies of the um, Assam, uh, trying to capture some retreating Japanese who were, they thought they would be able to go around either side of them. And they were going to meet up at this village called Zigon, um, where divisional headquarters apparently were already based. And they'd gone through the night. Um, night marches seemed to, I didn't really touch on that. I should have, I could have, I could have bored you all for ages, but night marches seemed to be their thing. And they were, they were going through the night. They didn't find any Japanese and they're approaching the village in the morning, the British village, it should, well, should have been taken over by the British. Um, and the, um, the leading uh, scout soldiers um, uh, were actually uh, mown down by, machine gun fire and they found that was they didn't understand why because the village should have already been in British hands and apparently my grandfather stood up on a paddy field um, a ridge to try to find out where they'd gone wrong were they in the right place were they not in the right place and unfortunately a Japanese sniper um, shot him um, on the in the second button down on, on his shirt and uh, he died um, there. So very sad, very brave man. It was made even more sad because he was supposed to relieve his command in Zygon. So he was on the outskirts of the very village where he was going to then return home for the first time in 12 years. So he didn't quite make it. But what my brother, my sister and I were able to do after our wonderful tour with Bob Cook um, amongst the hills, uh, the, the Naga Hills, we left the rest of the uh, lovely group who went down to Infal, but we flew to Yangon, as it is now, 
and went to the Commonwealth um, Grave Cemetery there. And uh, we went to his grave there, which was wonderful. Fabulous, Charlotte. It's a very, very moving story. I think uh, we've run out of time. There are a number of questions. We're very happy to email responses to you all. Thank you very much indeed. I'll hand back now to Sylvia to wrap up. Wow, wow, Charlotte, that was absolutely fantastic and um, really fascinating insight into the, into the battle. I know from the numbers of chats that we've had, there are loads of comments coming your way and a lot of people have enjoyed it this evening. We all think we know much of what took place, but small details such as Palsy giving Brown a jumper make us realise how much we don't know. And thanks, Rob, always to you for presenting the historical context so effortlessly. Um, I'd like to tell you all, if you'd like to come and listen to Rob live, he will be in conversation in uh, July, on July the 6th in York, um, along with um, Dr. Ron Clayton, who will be, they will be discussing and reflecting and observing on Rob's 35 years of writing and study of the Burma campaign. And um, we will be serving drinks that evening, which we'd love to tonight, but virtually, obviously, it's harder. And um, uh, tickets will need to be uh, will need to be um, bought, and they can be bought on our website. Um, for those of you that um, have not, are not familiar with our shop, I thought you would like to know if you've enjoyed our webinars. Um, you might like to uh, have a look at Naga Crafts. We've just new delivery of stock and there are some beautiful necklaces for sale. Um, and all of the proceeds, of course, go towards our fundraising. Uh, there's lots of jewellery, bags, necklaces, etc. Alternatively, if you feel that you'd like to make a donation, uh, this QR code um, will take you straight through to the donate button if you'd like to learn more about supporting a student or indeed helping us with our work in Nagaland in any way at all. But thank you very much all for joining us tonight and um, it's been terrific. We look forward to seeing you at our next um webinar in june and uh maybe hopefully we'll see you in york as well on july the 6th so thank you very much indeed thanks all bye for now thank you everyone <laughs>